Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Rights for Women. Today's episode is a craft of writing episode and it features someone that I think you're going to find very, very interesting if you're a writer. Her name is Angela Ackerman. She's the author of eight best-selling resource books printed in eight different languages through which she shares her passion for the writing craft. If you are a writer, you may have heard of the Emotion Thesaurus. It's a tool that I discovered oh, years ago now uh, and first came across when I was looking for ways to show rather than tell, something that all of us writers are very keen to do. The Emotion Thesaurus is a tool which helps writers show emotions through body language and internal reactions. And I believe it was the first of the eight thesauri that Angela and her writing partner, Becca Puglisi, produced. The desire to help writers in new and innovative ways led to a website called One Stop for Writers. It's a unique site originally co-founded with Becca Puglisi and Lee Powell, the creator of Scrivener for Windows and Linux. This creative portal contains game-changing tools and resources that enable writers to craft powerful fiction. Angela has a brand new thesaurus. It's called the Conflict Thesaurus. And as any writer knows, conflict is the engine of fiction. So I'm really excited to talk to Angela today about the Conflict Thesaurus and see if we can find out how we as writers can use it to power up our writing. Okay. Angela Ackerman, welcome to the Rights for Women Convo Couch. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's great to, to be here with you. And it always blows me away that, you know, I can be on one side of the world and you're on the other and we're just sitting here face to face having a chat. I still get all ooh about it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is fun. And, um, you know, some, some uh, time zones are a little bit more challenging than the others. Uh, this one is a little challenging, but um, our, my old business partner was from Australia. So we were kind of used to finding the little gaps in the day that worked for both of us. So yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Well, welcome. And before we start to talk about the fabulous new conflict thesaurus and all your other thesauri, I think that's a word, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about your own writing journey, I guess, and how you got to be, you know, in the position you're in now where you are writing these fabulous resources for other writers? Oh, I just love it when you say fabulous. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I took a weird sort of path to where I am now in that it was not where I intended to go. Um, uh, of course, I have a, a co-author. Uh, Becca Puglisi and we write all our thesaurus books together and we have several businesses together and um, both her and I kind of were on the same journey we both wrote children's fiction uh, middle grade young adult we were both sort of feeling like yeah I'm pretty good at this I think like I just need a little bit of work and then I'll you know I'm gonna have this wonderful successful career in in children's fiction you know like how we're sort of deluded at the start of the journey and so uh, the two of us, we both met at an online critique circle and we kind of fell in love with each other's stories. They were just really, we really clicked. We liked each other's writing and we started critiquing each other. And as we were in that process, we really realized, okay, we have a lot of work to do and, and a lot of growth here to, to actually become strong writers. And one of the areas that we really struggled with was description, specifically emotion description, because our characters, we found that they were always shrugging their shoulders or rolling their eyes or, or smiling. And smiling. we just yeah. felt like, yeah, we felt like it was bleeding the, you know, the goodness out of our story because it was just so cliche. And um, we just thought, gosh, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so we started brainstorming. We'd take a, a particular emotion like fear and we would start thinking about okay what are all the things that a person does when they're scared you know like what does their body do what happens inside you know what kind of thoughts are going through their head and we started building these lists and uh, originally we started um, and there were a few other people that were kind of helping build these lists a little bit but everybody kind of got they faded away and it was just really Beck and I that were were shepherding the project and um we decided to start a blog because back then everyone was saying, hey, you know, you need a platform and so you should blog. And so, you know, we decided, well, why don't we start a blog and we'll start sharing these lists and maybe they will help people. And we really had no idea, like just 
how much people struggled with emotion. The list became really popular. And after, you know, exploring emotions, we decided, okay, well, what other topics, you know, with description are people struggling with? And so we delved into personality traits and settings and stuff like that, and just tried to figure out, you know, how can we really show, don't tell? Because that was, that is something that I think both of us recognized that we needed to pr improve in our own writing, but also we noticed it a lot when we were helping other writers. It was something that was, you know, everybody, you know, had had various levels of telling in their story and or they were showing the wrong sort of things. And so, you know, we were we figured that if we could kind of build these databases up that maybe it would help people. And so it just sort of took off from there. We started, uh, you know, we turned the emotions of source into a book and, you know, the kind of the rest has been history. People just are, when are you, what, you know, can you create a thesaurus about this? I get so many emails like, can you create a thesaurus about this or that? <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's just, it's really fantastic because people really sort of click with this method of teaching in part of the book and then a deep dive into a particular topic. And it's a brainstorm list and it gets people thinking so that they can get right back to writing. And that's kind of the whole thing is instead of stopping and then you're, oh, what's going to happen here? How do I show this? Like you just read these lists and then boom, like instant ideas. So, yeah. So here I am now, it, you know, it, it's definitely not the path that I intended to take, but uh, it's super rewarding. Beck and I both love to teach. We love to share what we learn and we both really enjoy learning. So I think that that's why this career is a really good one for us. Wow, it's fantastic. And have you found that because with the number of thesauruses that the sauri, what's, what is the correct terminology there, Angela? You can, you can use, you can say thesauruses or you can say thesauri, either way, okay. there, it's both okay. right. All right, excellent. With the number that you have now and your fabulous, um, which we are gonna talk about as well, One Stop for Writers you know, web, website where it's all collated together, it must take up a lot of your time. I'm just wondering, do you actually get time for your own writing now? I think uh, like you're absolutely right. It does, it takes a lot. And especially with One Stop for Writers, I mean, I don't think we realized how big that project was when we started, but it's just, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's so fulfilling. So it's, it's completely worth it doing, but um, years back, Beck and I recognized that if we wanted to really do this well, we needed to take a step back from our own writing because we just couldn't manage it all. We're two people, um, you know, we couldn't write all these books and do our workshops and, you know, create all this content for one stop for writers and, market everything and you know we just we couldn't do it all so we decided okay well, why don't we kind of put our personal writing you know to the side really develop our skills and and really dig into this the source um path and you know down the road we'll pick it up again and i know for me like i absolutely do plan on going back to writing um you know i need to get to a place where i have a little bit of more room more free time a little bit more help but I really, for me, it's an unexplored path that I still need to sort of finish up. Mm. Oh, you, <coughs> excuse me. All right. You're going to have all those fantastic resources that you've created yourself to use when you do get back to it. So, so that'll be amazing. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if I even pick the same genre. Like I might write something completely different just to take the pressure off, I think. Like just because I've got all this knowledge in my head now and um, I think I might write something completely different and something probably just for me, uh, just to kind of just fall in love with the fun of it and not yeah. be thinking about craft as much and just sort yeah. of segue back into it. I think that's probably what I'll do. So. Enjoy it for sure. Well, you know, you mentioned the Emotion Thesaurus, which was your first one, and that's when I first discovered you and your your books and mm -hmm. the others came along fairly rapidly after that I have to say and I don't think there's a day that I go through a writing session without referring to the emotion thesaurus in particular but um you know I really love this the psychological thesaur traits thesaurus and the um the character wound one is fantastic so you know there is a whole lot mm. of information there and it is all collated on one stop for writers and it's actually a, a resource that I recommend to mm -hmm. all my writing students because it's it is so good oh thank but, you <laughs> but the conflict thesaurus is the new one and I've been very lucky to have a sneak peek of this and it is another amazing resource for writers so 
Can you talk us through what writers are going to find in this particular thesaurus? Uh, yeah, so the conflict thesaurus, um, it's, it's really, conflict is such an amazing piece of storytelling and it's something that touches everything. It touches your character, it touches the plot, it touches the pacing. There's just so many aspects of the story it touches. And of course we know tension is really important in storytelling and tension and conflict go hand in hand. So understanding how to use conflict at different levels in your story um, in different ways will really, really elevate your story. And I think it's one of the easiest ways to bring a fresh premise to readers because conflict is something that you can adapt it to any type of story that you're writing. Um, you know, you have so much freedom with conflict and you can tie it to, you know, whatever your character's struggles are, um, whatever their wound is in the story, whatever they need to overcome in their character arc, you can tie the conflict and make it meaningful. And I think that's kind of our, our real goal with this particular thesaurus is helping people see, you know, you don't want to just pick random like things that happen to your character to, to make the journey harder to their goal. You actually want to pick meaningful things, things that are going to challenge your character, not just outwardly, but also inwardly. Challenge them to change, challenge them to question their ideas or their misbeliefs. Um, how they see the world and change because that's what you know it's really about is that that journey of change because most of us we write um, character arc change arcs in our story and so conflict can really help sort of push that along if it's the right type of conflict so um, it, it's a great way to marry your character arc and your plot together using conflict so um, we do a deep dive into the different types of conflict, inner conflict, external conflict, uh, high level story conflict, the, the macro sort of um, conflict, and then um, kind of the, the scene to scene more micro conflict scenarios that you might wanna weave into your storytelling. Um, so there's kind of two pieces to all of our books. There's a teaching component where we kind of go through all that. And then the biggest piece of the book is actually the entries where um, I think in this one, there's 130 different entries. Uh, so 130 different types of conflict scenarios that are common to the real world and also fiction. And that one is actually really important because you talked about psychology a little bit earlier and anyone who's familiar with our work, we have a lot of psychology tie-ins. Um, it's our belief that the more you can tie the real world to the fictional one, the more your character behaves the same way, psychologically speaking, as a real person, the more readers will connect with them because they're going to behave the way people do. They're going to struggle the way people do. And so um, we do that with our conflict as well and try to, you know, create that, create meaningful types of conflict. Um, so the different scenarios in this one, um, this is actually a volume one because there's just so many different types of conflict and each conflict scenario is something that can be endlessly adapted. Um, and so we look at a few different categories in each one of these books so that we can kind of, you know, look at different aspects and cover different types of conflict so that again, writers aren't using the same sort of like an obstacle or a problem over and over. You know, they're, they're thinking about, well, maybe my character needs some sort of moral dilemma or maybe my character needs a ticking clock, something that's gonna put pressure on them, that's gonna tighten up the, the deadline. And so we look at different types of conflict scenarios and then really dig into, you know, what are minor problems that could happen as a result of this conflict? What are disastrous sort of outcomes, you know, because we always wanna make things worse for our characters, unfortunately. Um, but then also the positive aspects, like what good can come from this conflict? Because we need to remember that at the end of the day, we're trying to push that character to change and grow if they're on a positive change arc. Obviously, if they're going to fail, then, you know, they're not going to meet the challenges the way they should if they were trying to, you know, if they were the protagonist and we wanted them to succeed. So, yeah, there's just, uh, there's endless scenarios out there. And then each one, we try to show you how to adapt it, how to make it fresh, um, each type of premise. Yeah, I love that link that you've made there, Angela, between the different thesaurus that you have. So this one, the psychological traits one, you know, the, the character wound one, because 
as you say, it's also important, isn't it, to be able to show, you know, to really treat your character as a real person and to step inside their skin. And that's, for me, what these thesaurus allow you to do. You know, it's that really taking on the persona of that character and putting yourself into that situation and, as you say, coming up with some scenarios that, well, what if this happened to this person? And, and with those particular character, character traits, how would he or she react? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing is, you know, our characters are individual and and they're not always going to make good choices and they're going to struggle, like just like us. I mean, in the real mm. world, you know, we, we face situations all the time where we're like, I don't know what to do. And, you know, we have to puzzle it out. We have to sometimes make mistakes. We fall on our face. We make missteps. And so, you know, while our character makes those mistakes in storytelling, readers are going to kind of connect to that you know, they're going to be like, I've been there. I've made a mistake I, that mm -hmm. I have to now make up. You know, I've got to figure out a way to undo the harm that I did and reverse this situation. And so, you know, again, it's, it's about providing that good trajectory for the story, but also connecting readers to the experience so that they feel mm -hmm. like this is a real person. This is a real, this character is someone that I can relate to. Yeah, for sure. One of the things that uh, new writers, writers of fiction will often say is, but I don't want to be mean to my character, you know, and I guess they take that that idea that they're a real person almost too far in that sense that, oh, I, you know, they are, as a person, they're such a nice person. They don't want to be mean to someone else. But it's so important, isn't it? Like you say, you mentioned make things worse. And it's just the, the engine driver of fiction, really, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, you know, as far as the engine driver, we need to remember that we are asking our characters to do stuff they don't want to do. In the story, they're going to be facing situations where there's threats, dangers, they're going to feel totally out of their element, you know, out of their comfort zone, they're worried about humiliation, they're risking something, and we're asking them to do it. And this is where stakes comes in, you know, there has to be a reason for them to step up the plate and be vulnerable, risk failure. And, you know, so the conflict, you know, the conflict and stake connection kind of makes that happen as, as far as that goes. But, you know, this is also why we need to make sure that, yeah, we are challenging our characters. And, and you know, we joke about being evil and stuff like that. But we have to remember that, A, first of all, like I said, readers want to read about people who are realistic. If characters are happy, happy characters in happy land, not only is nothing happening and no one's going to be interested, but it's not realistic. Life is full of strife. Life is full of challenges and struggles and, you know, gaps in our knowledge where we don't know what to do or we're challenged with things that are outside our comfort zone. Um, we're torn in different directions. And so readers want to see that in characters. They want to see characters that struggle, that fail. And they also want to see characters that show up because that's what we do every day. It doesn't have to be this grand sort of, you know, achievement that the character overcomes this conflict, you know, in, in this big way. It can just be that they're showing up when they're scared, you know, um, they're showing up to do the hard work. And that's where readers really admire that. So conflict, if you don't have something that allows that situation to happen where your character has to show up, then you're kind of robbing that connection between the, the readers and the characters in that way. Um, and, and I mean, that leads me to kind of the second reason why you want to make sure that you have conflict and that you are doing bad things to your character. If our characters never experience anything hard, then they have nothing to grow and overcome and evolve, right? And, and, that's, and, and so if life is always easy for them, then, you know, where's the challenges that are going to help them see their inner strength? You know, where is the events that are going to, you know, help them realize that they're stronger than they thought and that they have power and that they need to steer their own destiny. So we want to make sure that there is conflict because those are important realizations. Like we all want to feel that way. And so our characters, you know, we need to see them feel that way too, to connect with them as readers. Yeah, so important. It's funny, <clears throat> I was just thinking the other night, my, my daughter and I are watching currently reruns of Heartland, that fabulous Canadian Australian um oh no it was Canadian show wasn't it it was another show that I think it is I don't watch yeah. it but I think it is I yeah. think it's actually takes place in maybe Alberta which I is think where so. I yeah around I think there so yeah and um my husband my long-suffering husband you know having to watch watch these episodes with us said um 
oh, there's way too much conflict in this show. They're all just angry all the time, all these people with all this conflict. I said to him, you just don't understand anything about story, obviously. <laughs> it's a challenge, isn't it? Like yeah. when you sit down with your spouse and you watch a movie or, or something like that. And I, I think I ruin movies for my husband because I'm just like, oh. and he's like, what? I'm like, well, he did this and it just doesn't line up with who he is or, you know, or, or I'm like, oh, well, there's, you know, there's the dark night of the soul. And he's like, yeah. stop it. Just stop talking. Stop yeah. analyzing. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier, Angela, was this idea of tension, uh, tension and conflict uh, on a micro and macro level. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you deal with that in the thesaurus? Yeah, I mean, as writers, we want to be thinking, um, like I said, you know, conflict is layered and it's going to happen at different levels in the story. And so um, you're going to have a, a macro conflict in a story. There's going to be some larger conflict that must be resolved at, by the end of the story in order for your character to, um, you know, succeed at their goal. Um, let's say we were writing um, a thriller and our main character was a police officer and maybe his main goal in the story, his macro goal was to uh, catch a killer. Uh, maybe there's a serial killer out there and that's his goal to catch a killer. So that would be like a macro conflict of character versus character. Um, you know, he's trying to catch this guy before maybe he's targeted the police officer's sister. And so there's stakes involved. It's personal because this guy isn't just killing random people. He's actually killing people that maybe the police officer knows. And so there's a ticking clock. He has to catch the guy before he finds his sister and, and kills him or something, kills her. Um, but you can't just have that one big conflict and expect it to sort of hold the whole story. I mean, we need lots of little conflicts. We're gonna have subplots and stuff like that happening throughout the story. Um, so in that case, I mean, um, you need to think about other obstacles that maybe the character is going to face in the story. Um, maybe in this case, with this particular uh, scenario, maybe the serial killer is also a hacker. And so he hacks into the police database and he takes the police officer's um, prints and he puts them in an active crime scene. And so all of a sudden, you know, the police officer who's on that particular, um, you know, docket, he finds the police officer's fingerprints and now he's a suspect. So now you have a situation of the character trying to, you know, catch this killer while he's trying to evade police because now he's the prime sub the su subject and suspect and they're trying to put him away. And so now there's like this other big thing to juggle. Um, it could be the serial killer comes and burns his house down because there's evidence in it. It could simply be something like, um, maybe the police officer is trying to get his, his sister out of town and his car breaks down. You know, conflict doesn't always have to be these big events. They can be normal, everyday, worst thing at the worst possible time, you know, type, uh, type things like that. So, you know, we just wanna make sure that it fits our story um, and it works with, you know, that outer, uh, whatever that macro story is. But we always wanna keep that tension going, we wanna keep the pacing going well, all that kind of stuff. Mm, you could have a future in crime writing, I think, Angela. <laughs> uh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. I do like serial killers, so. <laughs> um, another really important element of conflict is this um, balance, I guess, or, or using both internal and external conflict, isn't it, for your character. Can you talk a little bit about that and how using the thesaurus can help you with that? Yeah, I mean there's always going to be, there's a, always should be a good deal of uh, inner conflict in the storytelling, because that's where you have that opportunity to bring readers into that character's perspective. Like I said, a character that would be really boring is someone who always knows what to do, um, always makes the right decisions, never doubts themselves, never questions anything. I mean, that's, that's not realistic and it's really boring and probably readers will disengage. But if your protagonist or the point of view character that you're in, if they're unsure of what to do or they're, they have some sort of internal struggle, maybe they're being asked to do something that goes against their morals, um, you know, or it challenges beliefs that they have or something that they were told by a loved one, something that they grew up believing. And now, you know, they're seeing evidence that 
really the scenario is something much different. So, um, you know, that inner struggle is really important to kind of show where your character, you know, has some sort of clash internally. Um, maybe the things that they want are different than what they need, or they're struggling with duties and responsibilities because they're trying to decide, do I put myself first or do I put the things that other people want first? And so, again, this is, it ties into human psychology. It try, ties into realism. It ties into who we are. We're constantly pulled in different directions. We're constantly trying to puzzle out what to do. Um, we're, we're thinking about, you know, okay, well, if I do this, what's going to happen? What's the worst case scenario? Who's going to be hurt? Is it okay to lie in this situation? You know, should I just come clean about this, even though these five things are going to happen? I mean, that kind of stuff are, that's all things that we have to juggle in real, in the real world. And so we want to reveal that to readers to show that that struggle is going on because it, it, it connects them. Uh, it creates that empathy link and it shows, um, a human side of the character. It shows vulnerability. And this is actually really important with those tough guy characters. If you are writing like an alpha, you know, male, or, you know, if you've got a mercenary or something like that, you know, they're tough, they're a big stereo, they don't show emotion. Well, you need something to pull readers in. You need something to help them feel like they're connecting with this character a little bit. And even with characters that are highly alpha, sometimes it's just small, subtle things that can really reveal that, oh, okay, there's something going on here. Like they're struggling a little bit. They're questioning things that maybe they wouldn't have questioned before. Maybe they were just very loyal, definitely loyal to someone. And then something happens that makes them question. And now, you know, there's a little bit of, you can see the cracks happening, you know, in that loyalty and they're questioning things a little bit or they're asking questions or something like that. So you know, it doesn't always have to be something big and explosive. It really depends on the character. But yeah, that inner conflict really is important. Yeah, no, I agree. And like you say, all the, the psychological elements that come into that. And I know in the uh, intro or the first half of the book, you do use, and I think you do it in a couple of your other thesaurus as well, um, the Maslow's hierarchy of um, mm, beliefs yeah. and things, which yeah. I love because it really does, it just pulls all those different elements together. Yeah, yeah. Maslow is like it's fantastic it's I if you've ever been to a workshop of mine I've probably mentioned it and as you can see there's a pyramid in this book because it ties everything comes back to your character's basic human needs mm. it doesn't matter if you're trying to brainstorm their emotional wound if you're trying to brainstorm what their goal is in the story um, you know if you're trying to brainstorm really good conflict all of those things you can you can figure out what your character's soft spots are by looking at maslow's hierarchy of human needs and figuring out what's missing you know what is your character really sensitive about and then poke that area you know poke it and mm. see what kind of conflict shakes out yeah the other thing that i think sometimes new writers or, or writers who are early on in their fiction writing career find a little bit hard to get their head around is this whole idea of stakes you know, what's at stake for your character? How important do you think it is to have, to really know that upfront when you start writing? Well, I think that question probably depends on whether or not you're a pantser or a plotter. Um, I used to pants and I am reformed and now I, I plot a little bit more just because I really understand how important story structure is. And I know when I was writing fiction, my stories were a lot stronger when I did plot versus when I just like, woo, let's go. <laughs> but that doesn't mean my way is right. It's just, you know, just uh, something that I, I realized about myself. But um, story stakes in general are very important because like lots of cool stuff can happen in your story. I mean, you can have like a tense bank robbery, you can have car chases, you can have a tornado rip through, you know, a trailer park, like whatever you want to happen, whatever sort of crazy, you know, meth head druggy appearing in your character's house, you know, whatever you want to do, you can do. But without stakes, why should readers care? Uh, okay, so there's a car chase. Awesome. Why should I care? And that's the thing is stakes are what help readers understand why this is important why they should root for the protagonist and why they should care. So let's take that car chase scenario. If you've got a car chase and the protagonist is chasing and someone else in a car, it's exciting. You know, maybe they almost side swipes, you know, another car and maybe they have to, you know, weave around someone who's crossing the road or something like that. All these crazy things are happening, but 
at a certain point in time, readers are like, okay, but so what? Like, why is this important to the story? Why should I care? If you knew though, that the protagonist was chasing the other car because in that car, someone had, um, someone had just snatched the protagonist's daughter when he was shopping at Walmart. And so he's trying to keep up with that car because he knows if he loses sight of it, he can only imagine what might happen to his daughter. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't even have to explain that to readers. You just need to show that scene happening of the child being snatched and him getting in the car and trying to chase it down. And they're gonna be glued to the page because, you know, all of us, a lot of us are parents. Uh, if we're not parents, we have someone that we love, someone that we care about. We've certainly been to exposed to a lot of the ugly side of the world and how bad people can be. You would never want to see a child in a situation like that. So you're right away, you're feeling for the protagonist and you want them to catch that car. Now you're involved. Now you're invested. And it's because there's stakes. The stakes are personal to that character. And there's different types of stakes that you can use. And that is like a that is its own workshop. In fact, that's a <laughs> workshop that I gave for the uh, for the Australian conference this year. So, uh, when you guys have that in December, uh, you can, yeah, you can have a, a whole like several hours of Angela talking about stakes. Brilliant. But um, you know, stakes can can be where they challenge your character's morals, and something moral is on the line, something that they believe in, and so they have to preserve that belief, or they can't look at themselves in the mirror. Um, stakes can be, like I say, personal, where the character is going to lose something. They can be far-reaching, where other people have something to lose if the character fails. There's lots of different types of stakes, but essentially a stake is the negative repercussions that will come about if your character fails. What's going to happen if they don't achieve their goal? Mm. And whatever the stakes are, again, you need them to be high because in the story, you're going to be asking characters to go outside their comfort zone. You're going to be asking them to face threats or humiliation or rejection, things that they don't want to happen. So how do you get them to do those things? You do those things through stakes because mm. they're, they don't see any other option other than forward, even when they're terrified. So yeah, we definitely need stakes. Yeah, no, I agree. And, um, you know, I think that whole idea of what's the character got to lose and how's that going to impact on their life is so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, with it, like you say, whether you're a plotter or a pantser, uh, at some point you're going to need to yeah, at decide some point, on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the role of adversaries or antagonists, Angela? How do you see that that tying into this whole idea of conflict? Of course, in a very important way. In yeah. some stories, perhaps more obviously than others, but but I think definitely in all stories, you need some sort of antagonistic force at least, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I would say most stories do have you know, an antagonist or an antagonist force. I mean, sometimes you have stories that are, when we talked about macro conflict, where it's um, character versus themselves. And then the focus of that big outer story is really the inner conflict that they have going on. And sometimes that takes the front row seat. Um, but most of the time, yeah, there is like a primary antagonist or a villain or an enemy or some, something to defeat. And so when that adversary uh, be it be it a competitor or, or like I said a, an actual villain or something like that when it's a person I think it sort of just ups the ante a little bit because when it's a person they're invested they want something they want something that either the character main character protagonist also wants or it's the opposite of what the protagonist wants so it immediately clearly creates this this clash of this goal and behind a goal is always going to be that basic human need, even for an antagonist or a villain. They are motivated by something deep and primal within themselves. They're not just, ha, I want power. You know, like there's mm. reasons behind why they are doing the things that they do. And if we do our job as storytellers and we make sure that we brainstorm this opposing force, this adversary really well so that we give them credible motivations, we give them a really compelling goal, we build up their strengths so that they are formidable, well, it's going to be a really powerful clash because your character really has to bring their A-game to defeat the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that when you, when you do have an adversary, you know, it sort of brings that into it. There's this expectation from the reader that, okay, this is going to be harder. This is going to be bigger because this is another person and, you know, what they want and what the protagonist want, they just clash. 
and only one person can win and what's going to happen. I think too, when you have characters that are really well built, and like I said, you make sure that your antagonist is strong uh, in some way, perhaps in a way where your, your protagonist is weaker or they need to learn. When you do that, you also create doubt in the reader's mind. So they're like, you know, what's going to happen? The outcome mm -hmm. is a little uncertain. And so I think that that is kind of brought in a little bit more when it's people that you're talking about. Yeah, and it's good for the reader to be uncertain, isn't it? And to create that yeah. sense of unease because that's they're going to keep reading to want to find out how she's going to get out of this or what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about plotters and pantsers a little bit, Angela, but how can you just walk us through for each of those different styles of, of approach to, you know, finishing your book? How would a plotter, for instance, use the conflict thesaurus? And then how would a pan how might a pantser go about using it? I think probably, honestly, they would both use it the same way. They would just use it at different times, if that makes sense. So, you know, people who tend to plot more, they like to figure stuff out in advance, you know, um, and this can, you know, people, some people, they go deep, they need to know everything. Other people, you know, they just need to know some major set pieces and they need to understand who their characters are and what they want and what their goal is. You know, plotting is sort of this nebulous, almost instinctual thing where you're like, okay, I know enough and now it's time to start writing. So for plotters, um, you know, when they're looking for ideas, especially when they're looking for meaningful conflict that's going to tie into the character's arc and sort of tie plot to arc and bring those two stories together, they can use it in the, in the brainstorming stage to sort of, you know, go through the lists and go, you know, I really want to evoke this sort of internal conflict in my character. I want them to really struggle with, I don't know, what they believe. So, you know, what could I do there? You know, maybe I want some sort of relationship friction conflict where um, you know somebody's manipulating my character someone that they trusted and so what's that going to do to them when that happens and what are they going to start questioning inside so you can uh, a plotter might use it as they're sort of figuring that out so that they can see where things are going to go in the story and what kind of obstacles are going to naturally hold the character back at certain points in time you know when is when if there's an adversary or a competitor or an enemy you know when do they come into the story and how are they going to block the character those things are all you know they can use the the, the, the source to find those things out now pantsers um they do a discovery draft so pantsers again it's a little bit of a, a range like some people they know a few details you know they know a little bit about their character maybe a few details about okay I know this is their wound and I know they want I don't know to find true love or something like that but I don't know how that's going to happen and then they just write the discovery draft other people they don't know anything they literally come to the blank page and it's like let's see what's in my brain today and they just wow they put it out on the page and so for them they're figuring out who their character is what the story is about, what the character's motivation, what do they need, who's the opposing forces, all that kind of stuff they're figuring out as they write that discovery draft. Now, the problem with discovery drafts is you're starting either with nothing or you're starting with a few like sort of clay like ideas. And as you're going through the story, things start to crystallize. You start figuring stuff out. You're like, oh, this is going to be their character arc, or oh, this is, you know, how this problem is going to resolve or this is how this is the goal that they want they think they want this but you know what they're going to realize at this point in time they want that and so the start of the story won't match the end and so they're going to have to go back and revise mm -hmm. and so as they're going back and revising they really need to take that character who's at the end of the story now who's fully flesh and blood they know who they are they know their personality you know they know their backstory and they need to bring all of that into the start and that's where, you know, okay, now that I know, you know, my character is struggling with, maybe they have this debilitating fear of some kind. I want to think about conflict where that's going to be triggered, you know, where they have this emotional wound and I want to trigger that emotional wound. What kind of conflict can I bring on early on in the story that can do that? And so as they kind of go back and, and, and look at, you know, rewriting that story so that the character and the storyline and the arc and everything sort of matches up with the end, you know, they are going to be looking for more meaningful conflict versus just the ideas that popped into their head along the way because they weren't really sure what was happening or who was after the character or whatever. So 
like I said, it, I think it really kind of depends on plotter or pants or just where they're going to use it, but they would probably would both use it the same way. And I mean, if as you're revising plotter or pants, or if you come to scenes where it's just like, oh, wow, like something needs to happen here. Like we need to, we need things to happen quicker. I, I find for me, that's often something that I saw in my own writing and I would see in people that I would help when I would critique their work is that especially in the middle of the story, like a lot mm -hmm. of nothing happens. There's a lot of like, cause you're, you're feeling out ideas. You're trying to figure out how they're finally gonna like have these certain realizations that are gonna get them back on the path to their goal. And so when you're revising, you're like, okay, there's like 10,000 words here that need to become 3000 words. How can I get them from this point to this point faster? And the answer is often conflict, you know, bring some conflict in that's going to force that character to make decisions faster. Um, or force them to get into a, you know, from point A to point B faster, conflict can often, you know, facilitate that. Yeah, no, that's great advice. I really love that. And like you say, if you get stuck in that messy middle, which can sometimes really drag you down, I know I've been through, been through that recently. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really good to go back and think, okay, how can I, you know, inject something here? And, and it's like you say, it often is that conflict, isn't it? And ups the tension pushes the reader through the yeah. story, all those things that we want to do. Yeah, sure, for sure. Yeah. It must have been a massive task. You know, you were saying a bit earlier about how long it takes you to put these together. How long do you think it's taken you to put this particular thesaurus together? Uh, typically a book will take us about a year. Um, mm. We have a little bit of a, a process. I, mean, I have a co-author, so that helps. But it really depends on the topic. Like some topics require a lot of research. Like for example, the, the emotional wound thesaurus. That, I mean, you're looking at real world trauma because we connect human psychology to our characters and we wanna make sure that their actions and the reactions and their negative uh, coping mechanisms and the dysfunction that it is real, you know, to a real human experience that required a lot of research. And that book was really hard to write because you're diving into people's pain every day. Mm -hmm. So what Beck and I found is really, we could only do like a, an entry or two a day. And then that was it. Like we couldn't research anymore. It just was so depressing because you're just reading accounts of people's pain in those situations so that you can get the details correct. Um, and then other ones are a little bit more fun or easier, the ideas come faster. I would say this one was actually so much fun to write because it's essentially just talking about, okay, what bad things can I do to a character? <laughs> How can it go wrong? How can I make it worse? And so it's just kind of fun. And especially right now, like with COVID and everything, like, I don't know about you, but I could use a little bit of therapy and thinking about ways to torture characters is kind of therapy <laughs> for me right now. So this was a good, uh, it was a good thesaurus, a good timing, I guess, for this thesaurus, because I think we needed a, the stress relief of writing it. Um, but that said, it still, it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, Beck and I, what we typically do, our process with any book is figure out what the scope is of the topic that we want to look at. Um, we'll come up with a plan for, you know, what are the most important things that writers need to know about conflict, for example, and how can they apply it in the story? And based on that question, that's how we come up with what fields you'll see in each entry. So, you know, that's why we look at different examples. So you'll have a, you know, a conflict like uh, the characters betrayed. Well, what could that look like? And so we'll give like, you know, maybe seven to 10 different ways that a character might be betrayed to get you thinking. Because mm -hmm. again, we wanna make sure that our conflict is fresh because that's a great way to differentiate our story from all the other ones on the bookshelf. So, you know, we get you thinking about how that can look and then we look at, okay, what kind of bad things, how could this go sideways for the character? And then how could it be really bad? Like go from not good to really awful, it's gonna destroy their life or there's gonna be you know, lasting sort of effects that are they're really going to be painful knots to work out. But then, like I said, we also look at it from the aspect of what good can come from this conflict. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, I mean, even when you're challenged and you're pushed beyond your limits and you're facing horrible struggles in real life, you grow and you get stronger. And, you know, when you're on the other side of something bad, 
you realize like, wow, I am more capable than I thought. And you've, you realize like you're more fortified Mm -hmm. for the road ahead now. And our characters are the same. And that's why that conflict is important. So you do need to think about that positive aspect. So we kind of look at those type of things, you know, um, who else can be impacted? That's another really important piece of the puzzle when it comes to conflict, because it ties into stakes and personalizing the stakes around your protagonist or around the character that's experiences the conflict. Like I said, if a character's in a car and they're chasing someone else, nobody cares. But if their child is in that car being taken by someone that is a uh, in child trafficking or something like that. Like, I mean, oh my gosh, yeah. it's hugely, hugely, hugely um, personal to the, to the character. And so mm-hmm. we want to help people think about, you know, how can I make this even more awful? You know, how can we uh, use it to pull readers in even more? So we'll figure that out. We figure out what conflicts we want to cover. And then we split the thesaurus in half and we, um, whatever we haven't already covered on the blog, because we explore topics on the blog first to see what people respond to. And the ones that people are most excited about, those ones tend to turn into books. Um, and then, um, yeah, we write the entries. We write, we figure out what is everything people need to know about conflict in to, as far as how to use it. And we do the same thing with the, with the, we call it front matter. So the teaching content of the, of the book, we split it in half, we write it, we swap by the time we're done there's it's been back and forth between us so many times you couldn't look at a section and go oh becca wrote that and oh angela wrote that you'll never know who wrote what Mm. because we both added our ideas and um we just think alike so it works really well as far as collaborating great and you've been working together for a while now doing this so you've got it down to a fine art i imagine yeah 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 we are good partners so yeah we 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 get along really well and I have strengths in areas that that she doesn't, and she has strengths in areas that I don't. So it's just, oh, it's like magic. I love it. Match made in heaven. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about the One Stop for Writers site, um, Angela. If you're here, I'm going to give you a little scenario. Say you're someone like me who I love to write, and once I'm into the story, I, you know, I can get the ideas and the conflict, uh, you know, the the ideas start to roll and the conflict and the wound and all that sort of thing. I'm not a massive ideas person. So I'm not someone that has, you know, 50 ideas waiting to be written. Say I've got um, a kernel of an idea, you know, a character and maybe a situation. If I go to the One Stop for Writers site, what is the best way for me to approach that and where would I start? Um, I would actually like two things come to mind. If you are someone that, you want to take that kernel of an idea and you want to explore it through a character, I would suggest you actually start with a character builder tool. And the character builder tool is something that Beck and I created where it, within it, it contains all the thesaurus content that it has to do with characters. So um, the emotion thesaurus, the emotional wound thesaurus, the character motivation thesaurus, talents and skills, positive and negative traits, like we have our books, but at One Stop for Writers, we have many more thesauruses that aren't books. And a lot of them have to do with characters. And so what the character builder tool does is it allows you to start anywhere. If you wanna start with a character's backstory, it asks you questions. It gets you, gets you thinking about, you know, what is your character afraid of? You know, what does your character believe? Who is important in your character's life, um, you know, before the story began? And it prompts you to think about things like their emotional wound and what did that look like? And you can literally, if you like looking at the brainstorming lists in the books, it's the same thing at One Stop for Writers. If you click on this, on the emotional wound segment, it has the list of all the emotional wounds in the database. And at One Stop for Writers, a lot of our thesauruses are actually expanded beyond our books. So for example, with the conflict one, there's actually, I think, 15 more entries at at One Stop for Writers than there are in the book right now. Because um, the main difference between the book and the site is the site, we're not limited by page count um, and or the length of a page. So Mm -hmm. we can expand the entries. We can add more um, content to each entry and we can do more entries than we can in a book because obviously at a certain point in time it's it gets too expensive right it's a phone book and and you just can't sell a phone book so you've got to make decisions um, so 
you can kind of whatever that idea is about your character if you know nothing else except for they're a teacher well you can start with their occupation and the occupation section is going to ask you about okay your character is a teacher well these are the 10 different traits that are associated with someone who's a teacher you know they might be patient you know they're they obviously they love knowledge you know they're, they're they 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 care for people they're caring they're kind you know and right away you're like oh yeah yeah my character's kind and yeah they're definitely patient you know so you're already figuring out your character's personality as you go along and it will take that information and it will move it into the personality section so when you get to the personality section half your work is already done for you um it's the same thing you know wherever you want to start if you know nothing else about your character other than they love explosives maybe they're you know or they're a firebug you know okay we'll start there start at talents and skills and they're good with explosives it's going to tell you you know what um someone who's good with explosives like what kind of um, other skills maybe do they have and what are personality traits is good for someone who's good with explosives you know um, they're going to be detail oriented they're going to maybe have strategy is going to be a strength of theirs so it gets it prompts you with ideas at every step so that you can take that one idea and suddenly bring in all these pieces. So that's a really good, if you're trying to explore your character and you wanna get a really good sense of who the character is so that um, you can take that and then start building a story around them, you can start there. Um, we have tools for plotting too. If you're a plot first kind of person, you might wanna work with the story maps, which leads you through, um, asks you questions and leads you through um, the different pieces of story structure by giving you examples, by um, um, using, uh, showing you how everything ties plot to character together. So you can do that. And if you're really struggling with where to start or what to do, or even like how to go about this process of creating a book, we created something recently called the Storyteller's Roadmap. And this is really exciting for Beck and I because you know, we create all these tools for writers, all these incredible tools that do all these wonderful things like plot out someone's character arc, um, like the character builder does, or, you know, plot your entire story or your scenes if you want, if you use the scene maps. Um, the storyteller's roadmap takes you through the process of that first single idea in the planning part of the roadmap, all the way down to everything you need to know, like your characters, the plot, you know, if you want to think about your theme, you want to think about your world building, all of those things, it leads you through what you need to do to do all of them. And it points you to the tools at One Stop for Writers that will help you. Um, and it gives, like, it's full of our advice. It's our, our best um, knowledge that we have on the topic. It just uh, it provides you links if you need with more direction. And the whole goal is to help you learn as you go. So we kind of help you step by step through the planning stage um, so that you're learning as you go. And the next time you go to do that roadmap, you're going to have done it before and it's going to become that much easier to do. And then we do the same thing with the writing process and we do the same thing with the revision process, which I think is really important because a lot of people get lost at that point in time. There's so many things to revise, especially if you're a pantser. And you look at your story and you're like, oh my God, like, where do I even start? It's such a mess. Or at least for me, like my stories would be a mess. And so you have to figure out like, okay, well, where do I even start? Like, what do I even start with when I want to revise? And so we lead you through that. What is the most important things to work on first? And then, you know, what are you going to focus on in this round and how to do it? And what tools will help you and what resources will help you? And then you move on to the next round and then the next round. And it helps you all the way from that macro revising all the way down to polishing. And then, you know, how to get feedback and stuff like that. The other thing that I love about the roadmap is every step of the way there's problems we encounter as writers because either we lose motivation along the way or we have a gap in our knowledge where we just don't know how to fix a problem or we get writer's block or something like that and it's like what do we do how do we get past the situation and so what we've done is all the typical common things that writers struggle with we have like a code red section for each roadmap for the planning writing and revising that goes through like what those biggest problems are and how to solve them so you're not going to get stuck and that's the big thing is when we get stuck we lose motivation we start to doubt ourselves we feel like imposters it's like this 
you know, spiral of like, why am I even doing this? You know what? I should just quit this project and start something else. Or I should just quit writing and, you know, like go back to something else. And we don't want that. I mean, we want those stories to get out into the world. So if you need that kind of step-by-step uh, -step help, it's probably the best way to get story coaching without paying for, you know, the huge story coaching fees because it's just included in your membership mm. cost. Oh, it's amazing. I've had a little a quick look at this storyteller's roadmap right. and it's definitely got so many possibilities and options there. And combined yeah. with all the other resources, it's just, yeah, as you say, was, one stop for writers. It was kind of that <laughs> missing piece. You know, we have all these great tools. We've got this amazing show, don't tell database that has like all the information that you could possibly need to make your story amazing. And we just needed some way to help people through the process because that's mm. the biggest piece, right? Is how do I go from, oh, I got a great idea to like, I have a book in my hand. How do I, how does that happen? It's yeah. magic. It's witchcraft. Yeah. I don't know. So, you know, <laughs> we need, we need help or we, like I said, we, you lose motivation. I just, Beck and I have both, you know, we've helped a lot of writers over the years and we've seen a lot of writers quit. And that's so sad. Like, especially when it's someone that you see their work and you're like, wow, this person has amazing talent. You know, you don't want them to quit. You want them to get those stories out into the world. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, highly recommend everybody visit One Stop for Writers and have a look at the resources there. Uh, you oh, do have you. a volume two of the Conflict Thesaurus. Um, so is the first volume out now already? And when will this volume two be out? So, yeah. In the past, we've done two books at once, and it just about puts us in, you know, in a rubber room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we just, we just can't, especially as we add more to our plate, like one stop for writers, it's, it's like this whole thing all by itself. We just can't produce two books at once anymore. So we decided to do one in, um, to completion, and then we're going to do the next one. So um, the conflict the source, the first volume is going to be out on October 12th. There is no pre-order for it now, but if you like, I can leave like a link um, where people can sign up for a notification, notification, I can't talk, a notification, a notification. <laughs> put those together, Angela. So they can sign up for a notification. And as soon as it's out, like I will let everyone know and then, you know, release the hound sort of thing. Um, and then the next one should be out next year, um, probably in the fall, because like I said, it usually takes us a year. So if we finish this one up in October and then get going on the next one, it's it's probably a safe bet that it'll be ready next next fall as well. Yeah. And is the conflict the source information on the website already or will that be out at the same time? As yeah, it is. And I can I can send you links if you want. And then people like the the good thing about um, now, if you like, you have the opportunity to kind of check it out in advance um in that if you go to the link that i'll give you you can see what all the different conflicts are in the mm -hmm. book and you can also we've opened a few up so that you can see samples so you can actually see what it's going to look like you know what are the examples what are the disastrous results you know what could what positive things could come from it you can see all of that and get an idea of how it's laid out mm -hmm. uh, of course the other way that you can find out about the conflict with thesaurus is to go to one stop for writers because that thesaurus is actually already there and um, there's a free trial, so you can just use the free trial if you like, and then you can have full access to that thesaurus as well as all the other ones and kind of get a feel for, you know, whether or not that's a, a tool that will help you or not. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. And of course, one, one stop for writers, as you mentioned, Angela, you do have a free trial, but it is a, a member type website, isn't it? Yeah, it's a subscription site. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff there. And it's kind of like our, it's how Becca and I help writers beyond our books. We love writing books, but it, we're limited in the sense that, like I said, you know, page count. And yeah. um, we're limited to in that Becca and I are both really creative thinkers. And we're always thinking about, okay, how can we take this idea and really make it more helpful? Um, like, how can we make it more applicable and, and shorten the learning curve for people? A good example would be, like I said, the, the character builder tool, because we have all these great databases of information, you know, on character motivation and on personality traits and on emotional wounds. How can we bring them all together into one tool so that a person can build their character from scratch 
And the tool is smart enough to know which information is so important to the story, it's actually going to become part of the character's arc. And it pulls mm. those things together and it builds like a character arc blueprint that's accurate for that character in the story. And it's going to be a great piece of the puzzle for when you go to um, plot your story, you already have like that character arc. This is what, based on the information that I chose for this character, this is what the inner story looks like for them. And it's a good way to sort of help you figure out what if my story is going to be about, what kind of conflict is going to come into play, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. So, mm. Well, I'm like you, I think, Angela, now I used to be a, a full pantser. Um, and, you know, after five books, I've realized that the importance of plotting and structure. So, um, but with my most recent manuscript, I did get I didn't plot the whole thing out. I knew a lot of the important bits and pieces, you know, but I did get to a point where I really hit a wall and I really struggled. And I actually went back, mm. did the character builder um, and got the blueprint. And I have to say it really then just put me on track for finishing the book. So, um, you know, I can Good. highly recommend Good. that to, to writers out there listening yeah. and thinking, you know, how they might use it. It's, it's fantastic. Well, when it comes to our characters, we need to remember that plotter or pantser, it doesn't matter. They are the heart of the story. So mm. understanding who they are down to their bones, understanding their backstory, understanding, you know, who hurt them and what are they struggling with, understanding, you know, what fears they have and what lies they believe about themselves in the world. Those things are all going to come into play in the story. And the better we understand our characters um, and understand those fears and stuff like that, the easier it is going to be to write their behavior in the story. Because, you know, when you've experienced a certain type of painful past, you know, there's going to be fallout from that. Um, a good example would be if someone were betrayed by someone, you're going to have major trust issues. You're going to have a hard time building strong relationships. The way you interact with people is going to look a certain way. And so if you know that about your character, that they were betrayed and that they have trust issues and that now they don't even trust their own instincts because in their mind, they think, look, if I was wrong about this person, I, I invited them into my world, I made myself vulnerable and then they betrayed me. Like they're going to doubt their judgment, their gut instinct. Mm -hmm. And so you can use that in the story. You can show that through their behavior. And, you know, that is something that, that writers really struggle with. Like, what should my character do in the story? You know, how are they going to behave in the situation? The more you understand about your character, the easier that question is, because you'll always know what's motivating them and you'll be in their head. You'll know what's going on. Mm, for sure. It's been so great to chat to you today and to find out about the conflict thesaurus. I can't wait to uh, start using it and, and get it into action with all the other resources there. Where is the best place for people to find you online and the, the resources that you offer? Um, well, I'm, I enjoy social media. So you can find me, you know, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you know, just Angela Ackerman. Usually we'll, you'll, you'll find me there. Um, but you can find a lot of our resources that Beck and I've created over the years and all our books at uh, writershelpingwriters.net. And um, that's our blog. I mean, we've been blogging now for like over 12 years. It's I wow. feel really ancient, but it's true. It's, it's been a long time. And so there's a ton of articles there. There's, there's lots of knowledge, both from us and the people that we invite to come. And, you know, we call them resident ready coaches, just different experts from different um, areas and, and experiences and stuff like that. And so they bring their knowledge to the table. It's really fantastic. Um, so you'll find a lot of resources there. Um, you can find us at onestopforwriters.com. Uh, and like I said, that's kind of a, it's a, it's a portal to all different types of tools and resources and, and the storytellers roadmap that are basically will help you at every point as you go to write your story. Um, mm -hmm. We've tried to, like I said, try to think about what tools don't exist and how can I make them? And that's pretty much what we do there is, is we think about what we need as writers and, and then if it doesn't exist, then, then we make it, so. Mm. Oh, fabulous, I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of other writers do too. So it's been lovely to chat to you and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to you again for the RWA conference in December. Hopefully we'll be out of lockdown and yeah. able to get there. I hope so. I was <sighs> really sad that I couldn't come, but in person, but. It was nice to be part of it online. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I just hope Thanks. you guys. Yeah, yeah thank I'm you. sorry. Yeah. All good. Thanks so much, Angela. Have a great night, evening. You're yeah, there, you it? as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. It is evening. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.